Howdy folks, welcome back to another out of spec renew video. The last video where I did the pack swap on my old 2015 Model S here really popped off. So I thought we'd do a bit of a Q&A video answering people's most frequently asked questions from the comment section on that video because there were a lot of them. So uh, yeah, to start off with, uh, this is, of course, my 2015 Model S 70D, and it does indeed have over 470,000 miles on it. I'll talk a little bit more about the car itself at the end of the video here. Um, but yeah, that's just kind of a, a short intro for the car. The biggest question, and certainly the most frequently asked that people had, was how much did it cost to have this done? Now, obviously, I own uh, this electric vehicle repair shop here in Portland, Oregon. I work on all sorts of electric cars. Uh, so the cost for me to do this swap is a bit different than if it were a customer that I were performing, performing the swap for. But to answer just my raw, uncut cost for this swap, I got this pack for $8,500 plus about $1,000 for freight delivery, which is I would say below average for what these packs usually go for. I got a pretty good deal on it. Um, so yeah, basically 9,500 bucks delivered to my door here. Uh, there were a couple of other miscellaneous parts that we had to do. Uh, we had to swap that uh, ring on the rapid on the high voltage rapid mate connector. I don't recall the exact cost for that part off the top of my head, but it's a, it's a cheap part, like 10 or 15 bucks. Normally I would replace the seals on the rapid mate connector, but I think I mentioned in the video that I had already done that fairly recently on this car, so they were already pretty fresh. Um, and yeah, that's pretty much it for parts. Yeah, basically 9500 bucks for the pack itself. Now, of course, I do do all sorts of work here in my shop, including pack swaps, repairs, drive unit rebuilds, pretty much anything with the high voltage system on these cars. And this is something that I can do for, you know, pretty much any customer that, that would want to do one. As far as the customer cost for a pack swap like this, there's gonna be some variables there. Obviously, it's gonna depend on what I can actually get a pack for cost-wise, uh, just depending on what's out there on the market. Um, and also, to some extent, the condition of your old trade-in pack. Usually with the old packs, um, most of the time when I do pack swaps, it's gonna be people who have a pack that either has issues or it's gonna be an older pack, like another 70 or 85 kilowatt hour pack. Pretty much any pack like that, I would immediately go through it and basically do a full inspection at, at a minimum do a pressure test make sure there's no leaks in it potentially even open it up and inspect the bmb boards and all that stuff to make sure that it's a serviceable pack or uh, potentially even part the pack out but all that stuff takes a lot of time and a lot of labor so trade-in value as far as i'm concerned for packs isn't super high but it is something that i take into account for my pricing but essentially just to kind of give you a catch-all general price usually for a 100 kilowatt hour pack swap into a either a model s or a model x you're going to be looking at somewhere in the neighborhood of about twelve thousand bucks again plus or minus but that's usually about where you're going to be at um yeah so that's pretty much that um and like i mentioned i do all sorts of other repairs and stuff in here as well i don't just do battery swaps but i also do repairs on them right now actually just off camera here to the right i've got a battery pack opened up for a model s p85d that's undergoing repairs and i've actually got more cars coming in in the near future that need pack repairs as well and a lot of the issues that these older packs have can be repaired effectively um usually it's either issues with moisture intrusion causing damage to bmbs or voltage sense leads um, that's kind of one of the most common things that I deal with. Um, sometimes you can end up with a situation where you end up having a brick with a weak short, and that's something that's not really as repairable. Uh, swapping modules really isn't a viable repair method for these packs. Um, even if you have a huge pool of modules to pull from, it's still a massive undertaking to try and match modules to the packs. Not only do you have to have the voltage balance, but you have to have pretty much the exact same amount of capacity as the old modules, not to mention internal resistance, um, ideally the same number of cycles and calendar life aging, and basically to try and find a perfect module to put into a pack is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. And module swaps just rarely hold up long term. In most cases, they might last a few months to a year. In some cases, you might get two or three years out of one. Uh, but yeah, generally speaking, module swaps just aren't really a super viable long term repair. So. 
in the situations where there's actually a weak short issue with a brick, usually I opt to replace the pack and then part the old pack out. People do like to use the modules for conversions and stuff, um, or stationary energy storage or whatever else they might have in mind. So they do still have some value uh, being parted out. Or of course the ultimate end end of life situation would be for the packs to be recycled. Um, of course the bad modules either have to be recycled or dismantled to harvest the individual cells. Um, I haven't yet had to deal with a pack being recycled, but um, I do have a few packs on the shelf in here that do need to be recycled. I've actually reached out to a couple different recycling companies, um, including Redwood Materials. Uh, and yeah, I need to follow through with that and actually see about getting some of my old packs that I have on the shelves in here recycled because they're taking up valuable space. I guess the next biggest thing that was the most common was the weight situation on this battery. So a lot of people have this misconception that the 100 kilowatt hour pack is too heavy for the older models to handle. And I think they kind of get that from uh, basically Tesla's information about 100 kilowatt hour pack compatibility in the older cars. Tesla does not officially support putting a 100 kilowatt hour pack into a car that did not come equipped with one. Their claim is that it's heavier than the stock pack and that it would affect airbag timing and there's a, um, structural differences and whatever else. The reality is the 100 kilowatt hour pack is really not much heavier than any of the other large size packs that the Model S ever came equipped with. Uh, the second heaviest pack that the Model S has ever came equipped with was actually the 85 kilowatt hour pack, which would have been from the 2012 up to uh, basically the end of 2015, uh, maybe even a little bit early 2016. Um, and those packs, if I remember right off the top of my head, weighed 595 kilograms. Um, the 100 kilowatt hour pack weighs 625 kilograms. So that's like a 30 kilogram difference. That's like 66 pounds. Um, so the weight difference is pretty negligible when you're talking about the whole weight of the car. 66 pounds is pretty tiny. Um, obviously, this car was equipped with the 70 kilowatt hour pack being a 70D, which is quite a bit lighter than the 85 or the 100 pack. Uh, but even then, the weight difference is really not that huge. We're talking about maybe a difference of probably about 230, 240 pounds, maybe not even that much. Um, so it's enough of a difference that it does affect some characteristics of the car. Technically, this car being on coil springs should have the suspension swapped to compensate for the extra weight, but really you're talking about the weight of basically one extra passenger in the car, maybe towards the heavier, heavier end for a passenger, but still basically one passenger's worth of weight in the car. I'm still on the stock springs here, and the car rides at pretty much normal height. The, I would say the difference in ride height is negligible. I haven't really noticed a big difference as far as the, the stiffness of the suspension or anything. It might ride slightly softer, but it's really not a super noticeable difference. Um, but yeah, I might still end up swapping out the suspension with the heavier duty coil springs at some point, but for now, it seems to work just fine with these, and I'll probably just stick with it. And I guess going along with that, the other question that a lot of people had, which I guess I should have covered before, is what cars can have this pack swap done? And the answer is really any Model S or Model X can have this pack swap done. Doesn't matter what pack the car came with originally. Could be a 70 like this was, could be a 60, could be a 75 or an 85 or a 90, or even uh, the software limited 40 kilowatt hour pack, which was really just a software limited 60, but you get the idea. Any car can have this pack swap done regardless of what the original pack size was, and regardless of what the configuration for the car was as far as drivetrain. It can be a performance, a dual motor, single motor, doesn't matter. They can all be done. Uh, there's actually a guy in uh, Iowa that has done a number of these 100 kilowatt hour pack swaps on probably about every configuration of Model S that you can think of, apart from maybe some of the very newest stuff. But he's done a lot of them on rear wheel drive, both performance, all wheel drive, um, yeah, you get the picture. It can be done on any car. Um, and then, yeah, so the next question that a lot of people had is, does this affect the supercharging capability for the car? Um, and whether or not it can supercharge. This car does have free unlimited supercharging for life, uh, which it still retains with the pack swap. The pack swap does not have any effect on the ability of the car to supercharge. And the supercharging speeds are significantly increased with the new pack. I'm not going to go into too much detail here because I don't want to give it away. We've got a video going up soon that will actually be showing a, a detailed road trip style comparison between my old 70 kilowatt hour pack and this newer pack. 
Um, it's basically a 10% challenge style comparison, which for those that don't know, basically means, uh, you know, roll up to the supercharger with the battery preconditioned, plug in at 10% state of charge, charge for 15 minutes, and then after the 15 minutes of charging, hit the freeway, travel down the road at 80 miles an hour until the car hits 10% again, and that's basically the measure of the road trip ability of the car, is how far you can go in a 15 minute charging session. Like I said, I'm not going to give away the results here, but I'll just say that the difference in the distance I was able to go doing that test before and after was significant. Um, there are still some limitations for the charging capability of the car, mainly the hardware in the rear. So the charge port, charge port harness, junction box, that stuff is now the limiting factor for how fast this can charge. This pack is actually capable of hitting higher peak speeds than what it does now. Um, but yeah, the limiting factor is just the rest of the hardware in the car. It's technically possible to update the rest of the hardware in the car in order to hit higher peak speeds, but it's a lot of work to do that, and probably not for a super substantial increase. The peak speed itself would be a substantial increase over what it does now, um, but the sustained charge rate isn't really that big because then you're running into the limits of the thermal management system as well. So it would have a measurable effect for sure, but I don't know if the effort is worth the effect that it would have. Basically, in order to make that happen, not only would I have to swap out the charge port and the charge port harness, um, but I would also have to switch to the next gen style rapid mate, which they call a rapid splitter. And rather than having a high voltage junction box under the rear seat, the rapid splitter kind of acts as a junction itself and feeds the cables to the rear drive unit, as well as the cables that go up to the front of the car to go to the front drive unit. Um, different front high voltage junction box, uh, different onboard charger, all the low voltage wiring associated with that. There's a ton of hardware that would have to be changed and it would take a lot of labor time, and yeah, I'm just not sure that the benefit is really there for the amount of effort that that would take just to see a slightly increased charging speed. Uh, it certainly wouldn't be nearly as substantial as the pack upgrade itself did. Um, but it might be something that I might explore in the future just kind of to see if I can do it. Might make for a good video, so let me know if you guys would like to see that, and maybe I can look into uh, getting the hardware to make that happen, but yeah, like I said, it's, it would be a lot of work to make that happen. And then on a related note, the next thing that a lot of people had questions about was the range. How much more range does the new pack have than the old pack? Uh, the old pack, of course, was a very, fairly high mileage pack. It wasn't the original pack, which I'll go into in a moment here, but it was still a, a high mileage pack. Um, and it had about 16% degradation. The 70 kilowatt hour pack when it was new, as far as rated ranges goes, if you were to charge the car to full, it would show 240 miles of rated range when it was new. With 16% degradation, it was down to about 207, something like that. So about 207 miles of rated range. The new 100 kilowatt hour pack, I've only charged it to full one time, but when I did charge it to full, it showed, I think, 303 or 304. So it's almost a 100 mile increase, or basically a 50% increase in the usable range for the car. Um, now, of course, that's the rated miles. The older Model S's like this don't really quite hit the rated range rating. Um, so in the real world, it's probably more like a, I would say, a 70 or 80 mile increase in range, somewhere in that neighborhood. Um, so yeah, that kind of does it for that one, is, uh, yeah, fairly substantial increase in range for sure. Um, and then the last thing that I just wanted to talk about that a lot of people had questions about was the car itself. I've featured this car in a couple of videos on the channel here, and I've also got videos on my personal YouTube channel uh, about this car, but I purchased this from the original owner almost five years ago. He was a full-time rideshare driver in the San Diego area, and he put 400,000 miles on this car in the first five years of its life. So when I bought it, it had just a little over 400,000, I think 408,000 to be exact. So in the time that I've had it, I've put on not quite 65,000 miles. Um, so cl clearly not as much as the last guy. Uh, I don't know the full service history for the car. At one point, I was able to get a partial service history from somebody that worked at Tesla, but they weren't able to pull a full service history because I guess the, um, the way that Tesla kept, keeps track of service records changed at some point. I'm not really 100% certain. If anybody out there knows of a way that I can get the full, accurate service history of this car pulled, I'd be extremely curious to see it, because it's something that I really haven't seen before. I do know that 
Um, well, so the service history that I did get didn't go back far enough to actually even show the battery pack swap that this car had, but the previous owner told me that the pack was swapped at about 250, 260,000 miles. So the pack that I pulled out of it um, had probably 210, 220,000 plus on it. I highly suspect that that was a remanufactured pack, but the sticker on it was missing, so I don't really know for sure. But just based on the date range that it would have been replaced in um, and the style of pack enclosure it is makes me think that it was remanufactured because they didn't make the v1 style pack enclosures when that pack would have been installed in the car so i think it may have been remanufactured which if that's true who knows how many miles it really has on it um, as far as other service history for the car it did have the front drive unit replaced as well at about 375,000 miles and i guess i should mention both of those items were done under the eight-year unlimited mileage powertrain warranty that this car came with from new which, for those that don't know, Legacy Model S and X, from the beginning all the way up until 2020, used to come with an eight-year unlimited mileage powertrain warranty, uh, which is pretty sweet. It's too bad they don't do that anymore, but I can also see why they wouldn't do it anymore. Um, yeah, because it's uh, it's one of those things where, yeah, it's uh, any car that gets up to this kind of mileage is pretty much undoubtedly going to have some repair costs associated with it. And yeah, it had a pack and a drive unit swapped under warranty. Um, other than that, you know, it's had normal Model S failures like door handles, window regulators, stuff like that. Especially for a rideshare car where the doors just get open and closed all the time. I think it's had a total of like seven door handle replacements. All four door handles on it now are all the next generation door handles that use Hall Effect sensors instead of micro switches, um, which makes them a lot more reliable. In the five, almost five years that I've had it, I haven't had any problems with that. Um, really the only things that I've done to it in the time that I've had it are a window regulator, a 12 volt battery, a coolant valve, um, a charge port, and I think that pretty much does it, other than of course the pack swap. Um, so yeah, it's been a pretty good car for me for the past five years, and I don't intend to get rid of it anytime soon. The free unlimited supercharging sure is nice, and with the pack upgrade now it's certainly a lot more usable as a modern car. It's still not quite on the same level as an actual newer car like a Model 3 or something, but it's actually usable for the kind of stuff that I use it uh, to do, which is, you know, going to visit my folks occasionally, maybe once or twice a year, I might take it on a longer trip someplace else. Uh, like, I went and picked up the Selectria Force from Utah a little while ago. If you haven't seen the video on that one, make sure to check it out. I think the road trip for that might end up making it into a video on the Out of Spec Motoring channel at some point in the future. And that was on the old 70 kilowatt hour pack, so you might get to see the pain of what road tripping with that thing was like. But, yeah. Anyway. That's pretty much it for this one. Um, I really can't thank uh, the viewers enough. You guys really uh, pushed that, pushed this last uh, video with the pack swap up into the stratosphere with the views. And yeah, that's really what this channel is all about for Out of Spec Renew is you know basically taking older EVs and either upgrading them and breathing new life into them or repairing them when they're broken or you know anything like that really that's sort of the whole point of this is to kind of showcase that these cars can be maintained and kept on the road for the the long term essentially at least certain ones can um so yeah that pretty much does it for now and uh, make sure to stay tuned and as, as always thanks for watching